help me announce you here. Hey everybody, thanks for coming today and uh, thanks everybody watching online. Uh, today we're really fortunate to have um, someone from a real live hedge fund uh, to tell us a bit about what happens uh, behind the scenes. Uh, he probably won't tell us that much, I don't know, but ask him some good questions and you might be able to get uh, information out. Um, and uh, we're going to, uh, he's from Susquehanna uh, in Investment Group, is that the right term? Okay. Uh, anyway, it's uh, Philadelphia, right? So, uh, they're, they're one of, they're among the handful of uh, really the top uh, hedge funds out there. Um, and so we're fortunate to have him here. He's got an ulterior motive, which is that uh, he's recruiting. Uh, so we'll try to um, wrap up, uh, you know, after 45 minutes or an hour or so, uh, so that you can come up and uh, network a bit with him. And uh, if uh, you want to network with me, I'll be I'll be up here too. But uh, I suspect you'll have more customers uh, than, than I will. Um, anyways, let me hand it over to you, Todd. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, thank you all. So I'm going to spend the next, uh, I guess, 45 minutes or so uh, talking a little bit about both trading and quantitative research. And I know that you, you all have spent the last uh, semester learning about um, machine learning techniques as applied uh, to finance. I'm, I'm hopefully going to touch on some of that and point out why that is a piece of the puzzle, but not the entire, uh, the entire puzzle. So, um, so with that, let's jump right in. Uh, can, can you... Can you hear me okay as I drift back and forth because I tend to move as I'm as I'm talking. Awesome. Um, so uh, th this looks um, pretty ridiculously complicated for for just tracking the, uh, the moves in volume within one security. And, and this is um, this is how everybody used to used to trade by hand. So before um, before computers really computer analytics live computer analytics really got into trading. You would have traders print out graphs like this and and chart out these lines, these you know these bands uh, by hand to try to predict uh, the future. And ultimately, what we're trying to do as traders is guess the future based on the present and to some degree uh, the past. We're trying to figure out what's going to happen next because if we can figure that out, then we can put our money in the right place, remove our money out of the wrong place, uh, and avoid losses and, and make gains uh, as uh, as market conditions change. Um, Nobody does this by hand anymore, fortunately. Um, this is you know, sort of the, the essence of, of what it is to, uh, to, um, to add technology as an overlay uh, to the types of decisions that people are making. So why don't we have people making uh, decisions like this? Um, in short, it's because people are fallible. People make mistakes all the time as they're making decisions. Um, the good news for us is that these mistakes are predictable. So as we teach our traders how to trade, we can explicitly train them to avoid the mistakes that, that we know they're going to make and to be aware when other people are making these mistakes. Um, you'll see at the front of the room, or maybe you'll see uh, piled up on the piano over there are a bunch of decks of cards. Um, feel free to help yourself to, uh, to five decks or whatever you can fit in your pockets on your way out of here. I don't want to have to take any of these on the airplane with me. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but we use we use card games, poker in particular, uh, and other games as well, as tools for teaching decision making with imperfect information. And the reason, like I said, is because people make mistakes. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a couple of those mistakes just to sort of give you a flavor of, of how we talk about this at Susquehanna. Um, does anybody know what this board is? What this is a picture of? Vegas, baby. So yeah, so very specifically roulette tables. Um, and about 15 years ago, uh, the the uh, um, the world changed. The world of roulette changed because they added these tote boards next to next to the wheels. Up until then, they noticed the casinos noticed that the hardcore gamblers would stand next to uh, a roulette wheel and take notes, write down the color and number of the previous spins, and they said, "Let's make it easy for them. Let's let's take that out of their hands." And go ahead and just show them the last 20 spins or 15 spins or whatever it is uh, on the wheel. And you know, we'll even make it easy to fit, track the color by having the, uh, the numbers color coded up there. Um, and you can see uh, right here in in uh, wheel two, roulette wheel two, it had a lot of red recently and only a couple blacks. 
and with with the uh, the um, casino folks uh, knew is that there were two kinds of gamblers. There were some who saw who thought they saw a trend. So here, uh, the trend followers would bet red. They would look at the previous spins, say, this is a red heavy wheel, a red weighted wheel, so I'm going to bet red going forward. Those people, on average, lose about five and a third percent of their money when they bet on roulette. But then there are the other people who understand the, the rule of large numbers. They know that over the long run, you should expect to see as many black as you do red, and those people bet on black. In the trading world, these people would be called mean, mean reversionists, betting on stocks to, to come back to the mean price. And the people who bet that way, on average, lose about five and a third percent. So the point is, it doesn't matter what you're doing in roulette. The, the probabilities are fixed. The outcomes are fixed. Uh, and you have this illusion of control by seeing what's already happened um, and misapplication of things like the law of large numbers and the law of small numbers. None of our traders, to the best of my knowledge, plays roulette, for the record. So now this is sort of a strange transition from the last picture. We went from you know relatively high tech to really quite low tech. This is a um, bamboo and grass airplane. Doesn't fly. Does anybody know where this is from? Yeah. Is this a combo cult or whatever that study is? So yeah, so this is from uh, from um, the um, uh, Micronesian uh, islands, but cargo cults, um, which came up out of uh, out of World War II. So uh, during World War II, uh, the U.S. needed a base for the uh, the air war in the Pacific. So they showed up at a bunch of islands and said, "We want to bring our troops and our planes and our." And our ships here, um, and in return, it will give you the government some money, but we'll make your people happy as well by bringing goods. And the way they would bring these goods into these islands is by flying big bombers over the top and dropping gigantic crates out of the backs of the bombers that would float down to the ground. <clears throat> um, and when they opened up the crates, inside would be, you know, blue jeans or canned peaches or whatever um, they thought the islanders would want that would that would make them happy that the U.S. troops were there. The war ends uh, for reasons that are kind of bizarre. I mean, another story for another day. The U.S. drives all of its heavy machinery into the sea instead of leaving it for the islanders, and they're gone. And no longer are these literally great goods falling from the sky. Right? That was, you know, this is the stuff of mythology and became the stuff of island mythology. So these cargo cults sprang up around this, trying to recreate all the trappings that they saw around the U.S. troops that brought these great goods from the sky, that created these, uh, these cargo cults. So, so here you can see one of the airplanes that they built to try to replicate the planes that were left on the ground uh, while, the, uh, while the troops were there. I've got other pictures of, of, of uh, troops marching with sticks painted at one end that, to look like a bayonet, um, to look like the, uh, the morning tattoo, the morning parade of the US troops. They did everything they could to try to replicate the trappings of of the um, outcome that they were looking for. They, they did everything they saw the US troops doing, and they couldn't recreate um, the, the, car, the cargo crates calling, falling from the sky. And the impressive thing about this story, in my opinion, is that it didn't just go on for a month after the US left, and then they said, well, apparently we don't know what we're doing, so let's just leave this be. They still exist today. The children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren but the people who got to eat those delicious canned peaches are still trying to make it happen again because the uh, the persistence of the story is so long, it's so strong. We um we tend to associate an act an action that we observe and an outcome, which is really helpful a lot of times. This is what keeps us from burning our hand on the stove the second time. Like this, being able to make this association saves our lives in a lot of cases and and really you know lets us figure out how to how to walk. A, a, around the world, but it can lead us astray, um, which is a, another uh, trap that we tend to fall in, particularly in trading. We tend to try to replicate patterns that we've seen before, even if we don't understand the, uh, the overarching uh, reason behind it. Uh, and the last decision bias I want to talk about this morning is, uh, or this afternoon, whatever this is, uh, is uh, um, 
one called the self-serving bias. So the self-serving bias is our tendency to think better of ourselves. And, and to kind of make my point, I've got Marie Osmond here to help uh, with the Nutrisystem uh, homepage. Uh, so, does anybody know why I picked this to illustrate self serving bias? Marie Osmond did pretty well on this, right? She lost 50 pounds. Asterisk. Why is there an asterisk? Results are not typical. These results are not typical. Um, in fact, for Marie Osmond, these aren't even on the program that they're, that they're pitching. It, you know, the, the footnote here says that the weight loss was on a prior program, uh, and you can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Um, in a study, it says in the footnote, the average weight loss was 8.3 pounds and 4.2 inches on this Turbo 10 program in your first month. So um, Nutrisystem knows their statistics incredibly well. They know they are very much a data-driven company. They know exactly what to expect on their program. Their average customer is a 42-year-old woman who weighs 210 pounds, stays with their programs for six months, and loses 20 pounds over that time. This is good information to have, and they never disclose it. You have to really go digging in their uh, in their data to find this out. So why don't they say that? Why do they show you Marie Osmond instead? Because Marie Osmond lost 50 pounds. And they don't want to tell you what the average person can do, even though that's what their average future customer is going to do. They want to tell you what the special people can do, because everybody going to Nutrisystem.com knows the same thing. They're not average. They're better than average. They're going to work harder. They're going to be um, smarter about their decisions. They're going to be more dedicated to this cause, and they happen to get them at the time when they are most dedicated. They just type in Nutrisystem.com and hit go. Right? This is, they call them at the peak of their motivation. So at the peak of their motivation, they want to show them what's possible, not what's expected. Um, this is because of our tendency to, uh, to do the wrong thing, um, to, make, uh, to make the wrong decision, as opposed to uh, making a cool, rational decision. There's a, a line from uh, Michael Lewis from Moneyball. People operate with beliefs and biases. To the extent that you can eliminate both and replace them with data, you gain a clear advantage. This is Michael Lewis's pitch for this class. Let's stop having bad decision making. Let's replace it with information and data uh, that can really drive home a, uh, um, a decision. And I don't think I need to sell you on the fact that computers do a pretty good job of it. Uh, this is a picture of Watson, IBM's um, uh, supercomputer, playing Jeopardy against um, Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter. Uh, Watson won handily, and and the way. Watson parsed information was very much a machine learning problem. It had to do a lot of natural language processing in order to uh, figure out um, what type of question was being asked. The wording of the questions in Jeopardy is is a little bit funky and backwards, so it has to um, to, to parse that properly. Then search through um, lots of offline data. Uh, Watson was not allowed to have to be connected to uh, to any other data sources for this, so. Um, offline databases and information and, and in order to reach an answer. And interestingly, if you actually dig into, if anybody's interested, I think it's interesting, um, you, you all should since you're in here. If you dig into the answer, a lot of the, or to the, the methodology of Watson, it doesn't look for an answer. It looks for um, the, what is most probabilistically uh, the, the word or phrase or answer that goes with the question that's being asked. So then it, it provides weightings um, for each of the potential answers and only provides an answer if it has a certain degree of certainty in it. And, uh, and, and even uh, unless it's forced to answer like a double jeopardy or a final jeopardy. Um, and the, uh, the other interesting thing about it uh, is that you can see it, it's, its confidence change uh, as it digs deeper within certain data sources. This is, this is sort of the the outcome of a, a, a categorization uh, type of machine learning problem is, you know, the, you're, you're looking for uh, the, the answer that gives you the highest confidence. So I'm going to take a step away from Watson uh, to talk a little bit about uh, starting off with Lester B. Mike Pearson um, and Billy Bishop. I'm guessing not a lot of people in here know who either of these guys are. Sweet, no hands went up. I'm feeling good that I get to teach you something new. Uh, Mike Pearson, 
um, was a uh, prime minister of Canada um, in the 19, 1950s into the 1960s, introduced universal health care in Canada, um, uh, did a lot of, uh, of uh, sort of uh, liberal um, reforms that, that have persisted to this day, uh, pretty well, well respected prime minister uh, during his time. Uh, Billy Bishop was a, a flying ace in World War One. He uh, um, was was credited with um, uh, multiple um, successful raids in, in World War One, and then established or helped establish the Air Corps in World War Two for Canada. So far, so what? We'll come back to them in a second too. But first, I'm going to tell you about um, Edward Butch O'Hare. In the Battle of Midway, to seemingly unrelated things. So, uh, Butch O'Hare um, was the son of of uh, Eddie O'Hare, um, who totally tangential story, but so worth mentioning, was uh, um, Al Capone's advisor, uh, who ended up and lawyer, who ended up um, turning to state's evidence, and he was the one who got um, uh, Capone arrested on tax evasion charges. Um, died of of uh, natural causes from gunshot wounds to the face and body in the front seat of his car uh, a couple weeks after Capone's arrest. Um, like I said, unrelated, but I just love the story so much I had to share. So Butch O'Hare was a, uh, um, a US World War II um, uh, flying ace. He was credited with, I want to say 72 successful sorties, which was the uh, made him the, the most successful ace until 1943 when he died um, and, uh, and died in combat. And the Battle of Midway was a, a, um, a, a turning point for, uh, for the US in the, uh, in the Second World War. This, I just realized just now as I'm saying this that it's almost like today is a Second World War lecture as opposed to machine learning. So. Um, you're welcome, I guess. Nobody expected it, and I got to give you a little present, so here you go. Um, so the Battle of Midway, um, uh, the U.S. Um, was going to be ambushed by um, uh, Japanese forces, and actually in sort of a, an early version of machine learning and a crypt cryptography uh, exercise, they had broken uh, some Japanese code, figured out that this ambush was coming, and had their own counter ambush, which led to a successful um, uh, battle at Midway. The U.S. lost one ship, the Yorktown. Um, and uh, Japan lost six of their carriers, which was a, a pretty big success. So, so far, so what? I've told you a bunch of stories about a bunch of people that you're probably not going to remember. <clears throat> Does anybody know what the significance, significance is of having O'Hare and Midway up on the same slide? Not a lot of flyers? Yeah. They're both airports in Chicago. That's right. And uh, interestingly, Pearson and Billy Bishop, does anybody know how they pertain to airports? These are the two airports in Toronto. I don't, I'm not surprised that you don't know this. Here's a map of airports by country, or a you know, plot of airports by country. Uh, the size of the square um, indicates how many airports there are. Um, this is all over the world. So you know, there are on the order of, um, about 100,000 airports around the world, um, concentrated in different areas. Uh, the U.S. has about 15,000 of those. Canada, um, somewhere around 4,000 of them. So here's why it matters. Final Jeopardy category is U.S. cities, and here is the clue. Its largest airport is named for a World War II hero. Its second largest for a World War II battle. 30 seconds, players, good luck. Now, if anybody in this room would get this wrong at this point, I'd be very disappointed because you haven't been paying attention to the very important World War II history lesson that I just gave. But again, this is the, the match between Watson, the supercomputer that does a lot of, of uh, amazing natural language processing and data parsing, and Brad Rutter and uh, Ken Jennings, two people who are pretty good at it themselves, um, but much better uh, able to put things in context. So let's see how they did. We come to you, Ken. You have 2,400 for this final going in, and you wrote down what is Chicago. That is correct, and you wagered $2,400. That doubles your score. 
4,800 down to Brad. Now he had 5,400. I have to feel that he came up with the right response, did he? Yes, and the wager? Doing almost everything you can. $5,000 takes you up to 10400 Now to our leader, Watson, going into final 36681 And the response was, what is Toronto? With a lot of question marks, which means, of course, that Watson had many, many doubts. And the wager, how much are you going to lose? Oh, you see. $947. I think my favorite part of that clip is when Trebek calls Watson a sneak. Like, like this was this intentionally um, shady thing that Watson was doing as opposed to it being a computer that just got it wrong. But, uh, but I love the uh, attribution of, of some agency into it. <clears throat> um, so, so the point is that with context, um, final Jeopardy category is U.S. cities. I know. Here in, um, uh, so, so the point is that even with with the the incredible uh, abilities that that Watson has and that machine learning has, um, it's missing something. And something that it's missing is is the ability to provide context and and um, and, and make a guess about sort of the uh, a maximum likelihood uh, in a Bayesian way. So. Are you guys familiar with, with Bayesian updating? So given some new information, how do I now process uh, the information that we have? So let's talk a little bit about information. So uh, Susquehanna trades in uh, every market in, uh, in the, um, the US and North America, all over Europe, um, Australia, Southeast Asia, we're entering a couple markets that have been uh, difficult to get into for, uh, for outsiders. So we're, we're trading uh, around the globe. Um, we're trading uh, with an awful lot of, of data that, that we use for an awful lot of our purposes. So um, this data comes from a, from a bunch of different places. Sometimes it comes directly from the exchange. Um, this is true for the Miami uh, exchange, which just sells us their data. Uh, directly, you can you can buy it yourself if you choose to. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. You probably have to do a whole lot with it. It might cost you more than you want to spend. Um, Opera, which is the uh, um, the options um, clearing uh, uh, group for uh, for all U.S. Uh, all other U.S. options exchanges. So uh, so this is where you would get the feed for the Philadelphia Stock Exchange, uh, the Sh Chicago Board of Options Exchange. Uh, the Pacific Coast Exchange, all of these get consolidated into one feed. So all of this data comes in uh, to us from these outside feeds, either directly or consolidated, uh, and sometimes from third-party vendors. So there are you know, people like Bloomberg uh, and Reuters also sell uh, sell data that, that we consume and process. That's the external uh, way that we get data. We also generate our own internal data. Uh, so every day uh, at Susquehanna, we're, sell we're sending out millions of orders to the marketplace and billions of quotes. Um, we take in uh, this data from outside sources, uh, and we uh, create our own uh, signal that feeds uh, our decision engines for some of the trading that we're doing. So um, if we want to know the fair price for a certain stock, we don't just take in the New York Stock Exchange price for it, because the stock is traded on multiple platforms. So we incorporate the pricing and liquidity from these multiple platforms to come up with our best estimate of the current fair price. This is another source of, of data for us. And we take all this data and, uh, and uh, distribute it internally for, uh, for, the, for the different processes that we run, and also store it so that we can then later come back uh, and, and test uh, and analyze the data uh, for other purposes. Right now, we have about 15 and a half petabytes of data uh, in, our, um, in our system. So, um, uh, it's a lot. If, you, if, you, if you've sort of thought of, of the, the work that you've been doing uh, for this class, or that you've heard about with you know um, hundreds of gigs or you know terabytes of data as being big, um, we're doing big big data. We're doing you know we're working with, with much larger size. Um, we're, we have to store this in um, in multiple clusters. 
um, using uh, GPFS, a, a parallel file storage system. Um, so, so this is how we're handling um, data that we that we look back at um, uh, for analysis and for testing strategies. Um, but some of the data that we get, we need to act on uh, immediately. So. Um, Another big source for us is, is the uh, directly from exchanges um, real time. So if, if you send an order to the New York Stock Exchange, your guess is that it probably goes to New York City, which makes a lot of sense. The New York Stock Exchange is down on Wall Street, uh, in downtown uh, New York City. But that's not where it goes. The, the matching engines and the, the, the data centers for the New York Stock Exchange are across the river in Mawa, New Jersey. We've got a 400,000 square foot facility where they have their own computers and also rent out space for, for companies to put in their own clusters of computers. So we have uh, our own space uh, as close as we can get it to, uh, to these servers, um, which seems, seems strange. You know, we kind of all know the speed of light is effectively instantaneous, so it doesn't matter if you're right next to it if, or if you're 100 miles away, uh, but it does um, for, uh, for certain high frequency uh, or certain high frequency strategies, certain um, arbitrage uh, relationships. Have you guys discussed the efficient market hypothesis? Yeah. So the marketplace is efficient. There are no excess opportunities um, because if they were, they'd be arbed out. That's gross simplification and ignoring a lot of, uh, of uh, important factors about it, but that should sound a bit familiar. The arbing out is our co-located machines. We, we are the ones that are making sure that uh, that there is no uh, XX return available because uh, if there is, then our machines fire at it. Um, we are um, creating strategies that live on, uh, on, on those machines so that we don't have to send the data and information to another machine to make a decision and then back, even if that same machine were uh, in that cluster. So we've got um, some uh, um, some technology to, for, for this fast decision making. But we still have some, some slower decision making um, uh, issues that we, that we have to face, which is uh, having people involved in setting up and building uh, and trading on models. So what I'm going to talk about next, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on, on Brexit as sort of a, a test case of where quants uh, come into uh, to trading, where, where model building matters a lot, um, understanding data matters a lot. And, um, and then being able to execute on that data map as well. So I mentioned already that we have massive, massive amounts of, of data on highly liquid security, things like uh, equities and options and index products uh, and futures and currencies. These trade so many times a day that um, the, the relationships are, can now be pretty well understood. We can build really effective machine learning models that, that integrate the information from disparate parts of of the, uh, the asset world uh, to, to help indicate what the future price is gonna look like, how things are gonna change. Um, that's not the case with an incident like an election or Brexit, you know, a referendum. These are, you know, by their nature, unprecedented. Um, so these next few slides um, I've stolen from another presentation. That's why they look a little bit different. Um, and, and I didn't want to uh, change them because I want to make sure that I so we give the due to the, the people who did the hard work, the heavy lifting of, of, uh, of, of building these uh, models uh, and trading on them. Uh, so the question that we have to ask ourselves as we are uh, considering uh, a referendum or an election is what's gonna change afterwards? It doesn't matter if you do an amazing job of predicting the results of an election if you don't know what impact it's gonna have on a financial instrument that you can trade on. It doesn't matter if you do an amazing job of predicting it, um, if the results are going to have no impact on, on what comes next, right? If, you know, if everything is still going to look the same, then congratulations, you just, you know, won an extra 50 bucks on the Iowa electronic market betting on, on uh, political futures, and that's it. That's about as far as you got. But if you can figure out what impact it would have on, on markets, and you can also at the same time uh, guess the, the uh, results of the election correctly, you'll do a whole lot better. Um, so there's there's certain ways that, that we can gauge this. We can look at how uh, how markets move as as uh, headlines uh, come in leading up to the election, sort of implying a, a change one way or another. Um, one of the things that Susquehanna has its biggest uh, strength in, or oldest strength in is uh, is 
uh, modeling volatility and, and forward-looking distributions in addition to just spot prices. Um, this came from our expertise on the floors of options exchanges, which is still where we have a, a large presence in our trading. So, um, so we can trade options and use options to um, to, uh, to uh, position uh, ourselves for uh, for future changes, and also to recognize uh, what the market is implying about the future. Um, and and we can trade on those underlines if they are if they are mispriced. Um, so this is. A lot of words. I don't expect you to read it. This is really more uh, to help remind me to talk about what, what our quants were doing. I'm going to talk about one quant in particular. Um, uh, I'm not going to name him sort of out of company policy. We don't talk about the names of our employees outside of the firm. Uh, but I will tell you that he uh, majored in math at uh, Caltech as an undergrad. Um, and then he went to MIT to get his um, PhD uh, in math studying umbral calculus. Um, are there any? Umbral calculus folks in here. It's a pretty esoteric branch of combinatorics. Um, super smart guy uh, and a, a great game theorist. Um, really good modeler. Uh, he he um, came to us through uh, a consulting firm and then ended up staying uh, on with us. You know, probably joined the firm about 20 years ago uh, from this consulting firm. Um, and he's uh, he's run uh, groups doing medium and long range um, projection studies and. Um, and one of the best um, coders that we have in the firm as well. So the best use of his time leading up to Brexit was calling uh, LCOs, local accounting offices, all around the UK. Uh, so he would call these offices, just spent his day on the phone with them saying, what's going to happen at the referendum? Like, mechanically, what do you do? And they say, oh, well, you know, people write their, you know, stay or you know, remain or leave on a piece of paper, they fold it up, they put it into a box. These boxes then get carried out of these different polling places, taken to the local counting office, which is just an office where they're going to count votes. That's you know, where the name comes from, not that original. Um, they dump these boxes of papers out on the table, and then without opening them, they separate them, or they, they, um, they, they count how many votes were cast without seeing uh, if it was for remain or stay. Then they report that number to some other centralized place, and then they start opening these up and separating them into groups and counting and double counting, and then they report these numbers. My point is that this PhD in mathematics, this, um, this, this fantastic model that we had, the best use of his time is figuring out this very mechanical, very mundane portion of how the, uh, how the trade was going to take place, or how, how the information was going to come in. And only when we knew how the information was going to come in could we then project um, how uh, how to interpret the information that we were getting. I'm going to fast forward past to here, uh, actually to here, um, which is a pretty busy slide, but I want you to look at just the green line in this top graph. So the green line in the top graph is uh, the reported um, uh, stay versus leave uh, from all of the districts that were reported. And one of the things that our, um, our quant had found out was the order in which to expect people to report. So we had some prior prediction about uh, how what percentage of each um, local counting office was going, to, uh, was going to report for stay or leave. Um, and then we also had to uh, impute some sort of um, correlation between regions because we wanted to not only know so because we need to know if this region reported something far different from what we projected how much should we expect that to impact this other region um, <clears throat> so we can now using this model and using the, the, the groups that are reporting figure out um, what we would expect to be uh, the, the remain versus the uh, so these are um, uh, percentage, percentage difference from 50%. So at the start, uh, when the reports start coming in at 8, 8 o'clock uh, p.m. Eastern, uh, there's a lot of, of reports, uh, a lot of people voting for leave, which is not at all a surprise. The first people to uh, uh, to vote were um, were uh, parts of, very strong in the uh, in the UKIP party, the uh, United Kingdom Independence Party. Um, so we thought that they were going to be um, uh, voting on leave, and sure enough, they were. 
Um, but then as the night went on, you can see after 9 o'clock and coming up to 9.30, things shifted. And now the total count was to stay. And if you look between 9.30 and 10 o'clock, throughout the entire time, the, um, the vote was to stay. And this time, everybody was, all the news agencies were reporting the same thing, which was, yep, just like we predicted, everyone's going to vote stay. Or, you know, they made a lot of noise about uh, leaving the EU, uh, you know, about Brexit, but everyone um, at the end of the day is going to make the, the reasonable, rational decision uh, and choose to stay. This blue line um, is also pretty important. This is our prediction based on uh, the reporting. So even though initially uh, the reports coming in were to leave, they weren't negative enough according to our model. So our model predicted a small um, lean towards stay. Um, we were saying at the beginning, even though um, the, the counted votes were to leave, they weren't as strongly for leave as we thought they would be. But then as more information came in and we got to incorporate uh, these additional LCOs, uh, you can see that uh, we got more and more com or uh, we stayed in the in the leave section of this graph. Everything below zero is uh, is voting uh, for the um, e for the UK to leave the EU. Um, another important thing to see is these red lines. So these red lines are plus or minus one standard deviation in our uh, uh, confidence. We're not very confident initially, right? We're you know somewhere between when we thought it was one percent to to stay. Our range was somewhere between minus 3% and plus 5%. So um, not very confident. As the night goes on, you know, up to um, right around 9.30 in here, you can see that um, things got a lot tighter. By 10 o'clock, um, you can see that our, our band of, of, uh, of a guess was minus 5.5% to minus 3.5%. Um, but we're pretty sure that they're going to vote um, leave. In fact, um, that's our, our one standard deviation. If you were to look at our, our three standard deviation confidence, we're still firmly in the lead. We're 99.9% .9 sure uh, at, at 10 o'clock, that's this part right here, that um, assuming that our model is right, which is a very big footnote on this, assuming that our model is right, that uh, the UK is going to both leave. One of the one of the tough things about being part of a trading company is that you never get to be 100% sure before you get put on a trade. Sometimes you have to take risk um, in order to um, uh, to transfer information into the market, uh, and we did just that. So around 10 o'clock, uh, here are two of the uh, uh, the products that we were that we were trading at the time. Um, we, we started trading the uh, dollar versus British pound, uh, and we also started trading um, the uh, uh, FTSE volatility, the volatility of the uh, um, the London stock market. Um, and, and at the time, both were pretty close to where they had closed uh, at the end of their their trading days. So this didn't look like it was going to be all that um, all that great a trade. And remember what I had said before about where we get why where we get our information and why we get it. So we get information from uh, from the uh, the marketplace because it helps. It helps us um, figure out the best um, approach uh, to, um, to inefficiencies. But here we have to assume that the market itself is inefficient, that we can't use market information to give us information in using you know, sort of this efficient market hypothesis stand because this is um, a, a exogenous shock to the system that has not been incorporated appropriately. Um, the, uh, you know, so the, the punchline of this, I guess, is um, we put on these bets, um, and uh, at, at a time when the the remains looked like they were winning, um, we still got to put on these bets. Uh, and pretty soon after, it became very clear that uh, that the the leaves were going to win and did win, and the market responded appropriately. We got to put on these trades about an hour, half an hour to an hour before the rest of the market saw it. Um, I, I don't have. Uh, Similar slides for what happened with the U.S. election. Uh, I will tell you, um, the U.S. election we also called for not the media markets because nobody actually cares very much about the media markets, but before the stock markets had called the U.S. elections. Um, we got those right as well. Um, but we were much more reluctant to trade on it. And the reason we were much more reluctant to trade on it is because everybody in the room had an emotional tie to the results of the U.S. election. 
Nobody cared about Brexit. That's far away people we don't know. <laughs> the US election was really close. Everybody in the room had voted and then can't come back uh, to the office to work on, uh, on trading uh, through the course of the evening. So people didn't believe the results they were seeing coming in, even though the model uh, was a similar model. Uh, and in fact, uh, th there were some, some, uh, some noisy features of the, the data that was coming to us. Uh, but um, uh, basically, our reluctance to believe it uh, was because of those decision biases that I talked about um, before. I'm going to skip through this part um, to talk again about creativity and originality. Yeah, question about that. Say so it still did not impact the market. So, so immediately after the election results came out, the market was certainly not doing fine. Um, there, there are some complex features, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off on this and maybe address it at the end. There, there are some some much more complex features in um, uh, the U.S. election this time than there ever have been in the past. I said I'm gonna put it off at the end, but I'm actually gonna address it now, I guess. So um, historically, uh, Republicans have been uh, better for, um, for companies, and therefore markets tended to do better under Republican presidents, uh, and Democrats have tended to be um, worse for companies, um, usually through taxation policy, and therefore uh, markets have tended to do uh, worse immediately after a Democratic election. Um, but the big issue with Trump was um, that leading into uh, the election, a lot of his policies seemed protectionist, and uh, which would have been bad for uh, for international trade, which would have been which, which which was perceived as being bad for U.S. markets. Hillary Clinton, despite being a Democrat, was very favorable to uh, big corporations, which was seen as a positive. Um, but there was this this other outside factor, which was a very big one that was being considered, which is that there was a chance that the backlash against Trump was going to be so strong that it was actually going to turn the um, composition of the House and the Senate. And if the House and the Senate both went Democratic at the same time that the Democratic president was elected, that would have been very bad for the economy. So Hillary Clinton with a Republican House and Senate was going to be good for the economy, according to, to the markets. Hillary Clinton with a Democratic House and, and, and Senate would have been bad. Um, and much more importantly, um, it seemed after Trump's election that he was already starting to walk back on some of the more extreme policies that he had um, committed himself to, that he was backing away from those commitments, which the market perceived as uh, a reasonable thing to do, which is why it ended up rebounding after the election. So that's the, the brief um, armchair political analysis that you're going to get from me. Um, so creativity is sort of where I um, talked. Um, I touched on it with um, with uh, Jennings and Rudder versus Watson, um, but I want to uh, leave you with um, uh, the, the the reason I still think we need people. Um, this is uh, reasoning by metaphor. And I apologize for it, but it's still such good music uh, that I hope you'll appreciate it. So, um, an old poem with a new, a relatively new twist. Thirty year old twist. Now. It's just all the same. <laughs> You can trust me, the rest of it's awesome too. He's about to get into an amazing guitar breakdown, but I don't think I need to <laughs> entertain you with Super Ray Bomb for five minutes. Uh, other than to say, um, the ability to, to provide a different perspective is the reason that we still need people uh, in the in the process of. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> screen grab, sorry. Um, uh, is there's no, we still need people making trading decisions in addition to uh, the, the very important role that our quantitative researchers and, and computer technologists um, provide for us. Um, <laughs> so I think this is right about at the end of my 45 minutes or so. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, end here. Um, so since I've already been outed for having an ulterior motive of wanting to hire people, uh, let, let me quickly make uh, the pitch for, uh, for who's successful at Susquehanna. Uh, the people that we're looking for, um, we look for traders, um, technologists, and quantitative researchers. So don't feel like if you don't fit into sort of one of the buckets I was talking about that there's not a role for you. We look for strong decision makers, people who are um, who do a good job of analyzing information, making a decision uh, based on that information. In our interview process, we ask a lot of gaming and probability questions, not a lot of finance questions. For any of those roles. Um, it's nice if you know the Black-Scholes formula and you're going to be a quant, but if you don't, we can teach it to you. Um, we're really good at that. We're re uh, the hard part is finding uh, the, st the smart people to, uh, to begin with. Um, our quantitative researchers uh, tend to have PhDs, and by tend to, I mean all of them do, um, but uh, we'd be open to somebody who didn't. Uh, it's just very, very rare that we find a, a candidate who, uh, who fits the profile well, who hasn't done a lot of of research and, and coding up to this point. Um, our traders tend to come from uh, a, a wider variety of backgrounds, uh, frequently computer science, um, some finance, mathematics, statistics. Um, you have some people like me. I studied uh, American Sign Language uh, and anthropology and psychology uh, and education. So um, uh, fortunately, we're still willing to take a flyer on, on people without uh, uh, the perfect credentials. Um, uh, but uh, the, the trading role is applying these tools to making decisions about allocating uh, capital in the market. Um, it's, it's a really fun place to work. It's, it's fun to win, and, uh, and we do that a lot. So, yes? Uh, can you talk a little bit about, um, uh, uh, you know, a day in the life of uh, a, um, you know, say someone from my class is, most of them here are uh, getting a master's in computer science. Yeah. What What would a day in their life be like at Susquehanna? Yes, yeah, so it's going to vary a little bit uh, based on the roles. So I'll talk about the trading role since I, I just made a pitch for it, so I might as well uh, address that one. So our our, um, our traders start off as assistant traders, so come in to a training program, uh, and the uh, approach that we have for your training is to front load it with some some of the, uh, the finance information that you need. So, so some basic option uh, arbitrage relationships uh, and understanding uh, the pricing and risk of, of options. So there's a two week class early in time as, uh, as an assistant trader. But then from then on, uh, your days are spent uh, on the trading desk, getting into the office around 7.30, reading the news, seeing if there's anything that impacts any of the securities in the group that you're working with. Um, making sure that all the trades from the previous day cleared properly, so handling the operational aspect of the, of the trade, uh, make sure that the, the trader's aware of any risk that they have, particularly uh, as conditions change. Uh, and then at 9.30, the opening bell rings. And from 9.30 until 4 o'clock, the job of the assistant trader is to facilitate trading. That might mean trading on the trader's behalf, so they you know, might have a, a mandate to look after uh, certain names uh, on, the, uh, on the trader's book. It might be talking to brokers, uh, it could be working on short or long-term projects to improve uh, the ability of the, the desk to um, the trade or to, uh, to handle changes that are coming in the marketplace. Um, but it's going to be uh, focused on uh, the live trading, uh, active trading. Four o'clock, the market closes. Um, there's some cleanup that happens. By 4.30, everybody's done for the day. Our assistant traders then um, three nights a week come upstairs to our education suite. Um, two of those nights, they spend mock trading, so making the same types of decisions for the next hour that they would be making as a trader, just in the controlled environment where we get to determine what the order flow looks like, what happens with the stock, so that um, we can build complexity over time. Um, we get them to the point that they are doing exactly what the trader would be doing by trading electronically, which is 
um, you know, the, the, in a, again, a simulated controlled uh, environment, but um, without actually putting our capital at risk. And the third night is spent um, on gaming classes, um, focusing on poker, but uh, playing other games as well to talk about the decision process of risk allocation with imperfect information. Um, and also during the during the time as an assistant trader, there's a quantitative research project. So a group of assistant traders work with some of our uh, junior technologists uh, with quantitative researchers as mentors to um, uh, to ask a quantitative research question and then answer it. You know, go through the process of collecting data, cleaning data, um, coming up with hypotheses, testing those hypotheses. Um, learning the importance of, of um, you know, in-sample model building, cross-validation with a subset of data, and then uh, looking at application with, um, with, with, clean, uh, with clean data to, to measure performance. But, um, can you talk a little bit about how computing is involved in that person's... So it, the, the day sounded like I didn't hear a computer in, until uh, after the day. Yeah, no. So there's uh, so all of the trading that we're doing is on is on computers. Um, there there are very very few employees that are still um, on the floors of exchanges doing open outcry trading, and even those traders are holding onto a handheld uh, with um, a model that is is has been built. This a model selection um, question about uh, different securities that we're trading, uh, and a lot of the work that a lot of the ways that our traders are trading is not so much through seeing an opportunity and clicking on it, which which used to be the only way to trade, uh, but uh, much more from um, parameter selection and optimization. So as we get new information from the way things are trading in the market, um, we're updating our models uh, with with new parameters uh, to better fit our best guess at forward-looking distribution of stocks. All of that is, is, is very much uh, uh, computational and computer driven. It's all done on computer, uh, but it, but the the tools to to uh, parse the information and uh, and understand what's happening are, are also built by the traders as well as by our clients and technologists. So they are is it, building their own tools. Is it fair to say that the um, trades are being executed uh, algorithmically, but the knobs are being dialed by the um, Quants or the yeah, that's exactly right. So, so, so the not all of our trades. Um, for a lot of the small trades, never a, a human never sees it, and they happen faster than a human could see. It. You know, for 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 low risk or low dollar value trades, there's no interaction at all with people. There's notification after the fact, uh, and then they can change the way they behave going forward by by moving those knobs. But by being an active part of that knob turning process, um, they have a better feel for what's happening in the market. So that when somebody then quotes uh, an order through a broker for a hundred times the size of the normal trade in the market, which happens, um, they have a better feel for where the parameters came from. If this was, you know, something that was set three weeks ago and they haven't looked at it and they can they can't really rely on it, versus this is something that I'm on top of. I really know. Uh, a lot about what's happening in the marketplace, and I and I know that my, my parameters are good, and now I just need to figure out how much I need to charge for the uh, uh, additional risk I'm taking in this trade. Any other any questions in the course of the room? Okay. This is um, uh, this is our head student. Head <laughs> student. That means I'm heavily into toilets. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you said you know there's there's small trades. And those might be done algorithmically and a person never sees it. <coughs> How small a trade is so small that you would not bother to set a system up to it to trade it <coughs> so that there is kind of a niche for individual traders? Uh, we have, excuse me. <coughs> that question really didn't make me nervous. I just lost my, uh, my voice there. <coughs> um, we have not looked for. A way to carve out a niche for individual traders. <clears throat> it's, I will. Okay. I know. I get. I get the point of your question. But the point of my answer is that it, it's not. Um, it hasn't been our objective. As a result, it's not something that uh, that we have said. Leave that. That belongs to that other class of trader. This we do this big stuff. 
we've built robust enough systems um, that have the ability to incorporate enough information that ideally we can do a better job than a small trader could of handling um, uh, of, of handling uh, those small trades. Um, in particular, one of the things that happens with trading, if you're trading for positive expectancy, so you know, over the long run you expect to come out ahead, um, is that the more uncorrelated trades that you can add on, or low correlated trades you can add on, the higher your expectancy. But your expectancy should increase linearly with the number of trades that you do. But your risk only increases with the square root of the number of trades, again, assuming no correlation. So the more trading we can do, the better liquidity we can provide because it's actually lower risk for us for, and have you guys talked about Sharpe's ratio? So sharp, so the Sharpe's ratio is this, this um, risk weighted measure of your, your return. So how am I doing compared to how risky this is? Well, our Sharpe's ratios increase the more trading we get to do in low correlated um, trades because now our expectancy increases, but our risk only goes up um, by a small amount. So we want all of those small trades. They are risk offsetting for us, or you know, they, they provide canceling noise for us that we want as part of our portfolio. What's a small trade? <laughs> I think that's what I asked. <laughs> so there, there's no bright line answer to that. There's no, it's not clear that, you know, over a over million dollars, it's a, a trade that somebody looks at. Under a million dollars is a trade that nobody looks at. Um, it's going to vary a lot by product, a lot by the current risk that we have in that product, the expected forward-looking liquidity in that product. So, so part of the risk that we have is, um, is this uncertain future. But another part of the risk that we have is, the, uh, is that we might end up having to hold a position um, that, that we either can't finance, which um, which, if I had said if I had said that ten years ago, everybody in the world would have chuckled. Like, what do you mean you can't finance a position? Ha ha ha! Obviously, banks finance positions. That's what they're there for. That's what prime brokers do. And then 2008 came along, and the entirety of 2008, the entire story of 2008, was nobody could finance positions anymore. Nobody was willing to hold risky assets and provide capital against them. Right. So, um, so that's something that we have to consider in in terms of the size of the trades. So, a, a small trade in um, in uh, the S&P 500 might be a big trade in a mortgage-backed security. So it's not a dollar amount or a number of contracts. It, it is related to um, liquidity and risk. So um, uh, one of the other people asked, uh, let me ask a couple questions just because I'm selfish. Yeah. Um, okay, think about your co-located uh, machines at uh, New York Stock Exchange. Um, yeah. Presumably those are um, high frequency, Yep. and probably large cap, you know, trading large cap stocks, I'm guessing. Uh, what um, what sort of, if you can say, what sort of volume would you say you all are, um, dollar volume per day of, of that exchange? Uh, I don't know the answer, so I, so I don't want to try to take a swipe at it because I could be off by a okay. lot. Um, are you totally out at the end of the day for those sorts of uh, strategies? The way we measure risk, I would say yes, we're out at the end of the day. That that our risk profile at the end of the day does not look um, any riskier than it did at the beginning of the day. But that does not mean that we traded, that we opened and closed the same positions over the course of the day. Mm -hmm. um, that is very much a. Um, there are firms that that pride themselves on having done that, and we've done our own sort of back of the envelope analytics of those firms' performance. And we've concluded that they are giving up a lot of their potential profit by making sure that they're trading flat. Mm -hmm. um, that they're, they're crossing spreads that they don't need to cross um, for for risk mitigation uh, purposes. And um, <clears throat> and we've actually found ways to identify those trades and be on the other side of. Them. We think that they mm -hmm. they're giving up enough that um, it's profitable to uh, to be the ones that are taking. Um, how would you characterize uh, like the first half hour of the market? Like my my experience in sort of small small league um, uh, hedge fund management is um, uh, you don't want to be you don't want to be part of the market open uh, unless well unless you're taking money from somebody um, 
and you ought to you ought to wait in until about a half hour into the day before you do anything. Um, if we were if we were running only um, if, if we were running strategies that perform best with low noise, then I would totally agree that that um, any any strategy where you say you know I, I know what the signal is, and I want to avoid the noise so that I can you know capture as much of that signal as possible. Then it's certainly noisiest on the market open and the market closed. And, and tends to quiet out in the middle of the day. For us, um, the, those noisy times um, mean that there's um, higher realized by volatility, high, higher implied volatility during those times, um, which often leads to different strategies that we can uh, implement to capture um, the, that excess volatility. So we are very much involved. Uh, we would be very sad to miss the open or the close. Mm -hmm. um, that's where a, a lot of uh, a lot of our profits come from. Is uh, is mispricings around those times? Okay. Any uh, questions here? Uh, like, uh, are you implementing your trading strategies? Uh, how do you decide on the financial products you're going to trade on? How do we decide on? Sorry, what? Uh, the financial products, say for example, for the big business. Yeah. Uh, how do you come up with those uh, financial products? Uh, uh, yeah. So, um, so often we're not in that situation. We you know, we don't get referendums and uh, and elections all that often. Um, so, so we're often not in a position to um, to decide on it. Uh, but for for Brexit, um, our our choices were pretty limited uh, based on uh, the overnight liquidity. That the results were going to be coming out um, well after the U.S. closed, uh, and there aren't that many products that that were trading at that time uh, that we thought would have the, would be able to absorb the liquidity that we wanted for the size of positions that we wanted to put on for the risk that we were willing to take, uh, and that um, uh, that we're also going to move uh, with the markets. The currency markets were a really good place to start, um, and uh, the, um, the the FTSE futures and uh, and volatility indexes uh, were the other uh, two that we thought would have enough liquidity uh, as well as um, move on the results. So. Uh, so th those were the areas that we uh, that we focused on. There are a couple other sub products that um, uh, that also have um, uh, outsized liquidity in the overnight for for various reasons that we were willing to trade at that time. But but the the concentration of the positions we took were in those other areas. Yes. Um, we know that Christina did well for Brexit and the U.S. election. Um, I'm sure there have been instances when. You did not do it, and how? What could you give an example? And how exactly did you change your strategy? So um, there, I, I can't come up with an example of um, a very large <clears throat> um, places where we lost because um, our approaches have been um, to uh, to adjust dynamically to market conditions. So if we start losing. We stop and reevaluate as opposed to just saying, well, this is what the machine said. What am I going to do? Say no to the machine? It's, it's in control here. We, we know that it's the, the people who control the machine and not the other way around. So I don't have uh, any great examples of that other than um, arguably uh, one I already referenced, which was um, the financing crisis in 2008. So we had uh, at the time uh, some, uh, some positions that were difficult to finance. Um, fortunately for us, uh, the, uh, those, those Difficult assets, um, or the times of difficult assets matched up with times of, of much, much higher market volatility and, and some really amazing trading opportunities. So, uh, um, while I certainly wouldn't wish for another 2008, it, it, it could have worked. If we, if we were only a, a you know, long term fixed income um, hedge fund, uh, it would have been very, very bad for us. But, uh, but for you know, the diversified assets that we have, uh, it worked out very well for us. Yes. How big of a challenge does your uh, size uh, factor into as far as uh, model building and strategies? Like, um, how mobile are you able to be in the market? So, so it's funny because I'm not even sure which way you're asking that question because people ask that in either way. I, they either say you guys are so small, like can you can you get you know a critical mass to put on a trade? They say you guys are so big, it's like turning the you know. The Queen Elizabeth uh, cruise ship, like you know, you're just not going to be able to do it in time. So I'm not sure which of those you intend, and you don't need to even clarify. No, yeah, no, yeah. I, I purposely, uh, I purposely did that because I want to see what your reaction. Yeah. So, 
Um, so we are, um, we are the uh, you know the the Goldilocks baby bear. We're we're just right. You know, we we ha we have the um, the capital that we need to put on um, uh, to, to express any opinion that we want in the market. So there's never been a time where we felt capital constrained to be able to uh, to to, um, to put on a trade. But at the same time, um, we are not. Um, uh, so behemoth that we that we have um, uh, restrictions that have come out of uh, out of our side. So uh, um, the we're we're very capable of putting on uh, and taking off large positions um, in short periods of time. So um, you know, it hasn't our, our size, whether it's too big or too little, hasn't been an issue, which makes me think we're just right. So let me um, go ahead and wrap it up now. So. Um there's some time to talk to uh, Todd individually. Um, and uh, thanks very much, uh, Todd, for your uh, talk. Okay. Thank you.